And we are live. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Tirza Hollenhorst, and I am the CEO at Lumen. And I am joined here this week again with Helena. Um, but this week, we're reversing the roles a little bit. Helena um, led a hybrid work change management initiative at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. And um, her experience has really kicked off our approach to hybrid work and how we're going to rebuild an office culture. I'm just really excited to talk to her today about her experiences and um, how the initiative went. So um, welcome, Helena. And I'd love for you to start us off today by just um, telling me a bit about what you found exciting about this initiative. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me here. And I'm very excited as well to, to be in the hot seat this morning. Um, but what excited me the most about this initiative, we were in the middle of a lockdown, right? Everyone was in 2021. And um, we knew that we weren't going to be stepping into the future as you know and going back in time and going back to the office as we were but we were stepping into the future and we wanted to create something new and what's great about this initiative is that our leadership understood that we needed to do something different we needed a change management approach we needed to design an active you know how are we going to step into the future and what was most exciting is that we were able to do so um, by including people's voice. And so, you know, typically you'll have ideas and then their visions are developed and solutions executed and then you realize that they don't really fit. But this one was different uh, because we were, we really had this, this team that really believed in including people's voices. And we needed to include people's voices because we really didn't know how we were going to be stepping into the future, right? We, we knew that the way things were working in the past hadn't worked really well because, and I think a lot of people can relate with this because we used to be sitting in an office that was, it was flexible seating, but most of us were stuck in a phone booth all day long, stuck in a phone booth all day long. We didn't get enough oxygen. Um, we weren't really talking with one another. And that was the work day. You came into the office to do that. And a lot of us were also asked to sit near our managers, not all of us, but a lot of us. And our managers would sit in offices all day long. And then whenever they needed something, they would come out and talk to us. But they as well were in, you know, their meetings um, all day long. And so this was something, a point of frustration that we just didn't want to go back to. And so including the voice of the people into our, you know, into that process, into like, what is our purpose? Why are we going back to the office for? What didn't work in the past that we want to leave in the past? What actually worked in the past that we do want to take with us into the future? And what does that even look like? And so we learned a bunch of things by just developing this vision and understanding what people needed. And they came up with um, great ideas and said, well, we would like to actually just come into the office for more collaborative and creative type of work because we now, you know, everyone's in lockdown. Everyone understands what remote work is. Everyone feels the, the increase in, in productivity. And they're like, well, actually, I don't want to give that up for my individual tasks because I'm much more focused. But I do miss the spontaneous interactions, the, you know, the idea bouncing off of each other, um, being able to network, being able to see my mentor in person, being able to see my boss in person. Like those were kind of the things that people were sharing with us that they actually missed. And so the exciting thing for us is that we were able to incorporate that into our vision and really incorporate people's voices as well, because in the environment that we were in, um, we had this challenge of having a disconnect between leadership and people where leaders couldn't really get people to speak up and speak their voice and understand, okay, what's really going on? What are really the challenges? And so having that change management team really allowed us to be that spinning disc, I like to call it, between people and represent their voices and have that actually influence the decisions that we were taking when we were talking 
um, with our executive leadership. So that was that was really great to have. And people gave us very positive feedback and, and were grateful to be engaged and aware of what was going on and informed on the progress that we were making with regards to you know, how we were developing the workspace, how we were going to be shaping it and how we were going to be turning it into something that they had been part of uh, shaping. So that was what excited me the most, I would say. Nice. You know, um, I've, I think it's really in, kind of funny how pre-pandemic the office was like the brunt, brunt of all these jokes about how bad it was and like, how things didn't get done there and people would talk about they need to like go home to actually work. Um, and now there's something about that that we're missing. But the idea that we would go back, like the, nobody wants to go back to be yeah. phone booth. Like the if we if we're doing things that are individual work like sales calls or programming, there's something to be said for being in a place where it's just you and there isn't the distractions and you have your like you know, super set up and um, your healthy snacks, hopefully. Um, and, and forgetting about the commute time because that really, it was a drag and, and now there's, but there's something that got lost there. And so we are looking for these creative ways to come back. Uh, and I really just appreciate that this approach was really focused on what do people actually want to come back for? And I think it would be useful for our audience to hear just to kind of, um, like a succinct play-by-play -play of how you guys actually made the change. And so do you want to walk us through that kind of linear process of what you did? Mm -hmm. I think we did, we laid the foundation for change, I want to say, because this is where the learnings come in, right? We laid the foundation. We got, we included people's voices. We defined the collaborative, how the shape was going to be reshaped and redesigned, and there was going to be more collaborative space. So that worked really well. And we set up guidelines in terms of, you know, this, these are quiet areas. This is more hyper creative, collaborative environments. And so we were kind of giving people guidelines what to do and how to behave themselves, if you wish, in these environments where, you know, where, where they shouldn't be talking or where they could be. Um, and so those were great to have as you know foundational steps to take and to include people's voice and to get that ball rolling into that process but what we learned is um we had also built a change management community that had like their ties into all of the different teams that was feeding up the information and we were communicating via them as well and then when it came to the time of okay well now we're going to be preparing to step back into the office and we knew that there were so many different um, working needs. And I mean, like mere project base, like there, an HR department has different workflows, different um, projects, different type of needs to come together than, for example, a strategy department or a product development department that maybe works in sprints, for example, and mm -hmm. is, you know, in maybe in the middle of um, developing a prototype and testing that with their customer in, you know, week three of month of December or something like that, you know? And so we just realized that we couldn't have some kind of um, approach or blueprint and just mandate that on. We really realized that we needed those change ambassadors with their ties into the teams to have a conversation about what do we want to go back to the office for? How how are we going to turn this vision into our realities? How are we going to make it ours? How do we, what does, you know, hybrid work mean to us? How are we going to organize around it? Um, what type of activities do we want to go and meet on site for? And which ones are we going to do remotely? And what was really interesting through those conversations um, and through that activity is number one, I learned that not all change ambassadors were equipped with the right skill and resources to facilitate those kind of conversations. So I learned a tremendous amount about what type of change ambassador are actually also early adopters and understand how to facilitate those conversation. Bless you. <laughs> and number two, I, um, I also learned that the magic of change really happens on the team. Mm. Like, because we did have a few of those early adopter and within our change ambassador community that went and did these kind of workshops with their teams like okay team you know what are we gonna how are we gonna step into the future how are we gonna do things differently and um 
And then some of the, some questions arose. They were asking themselves, <laughs> you know, <the> sneeze. <laughs> um, some questions arose where they said, okay, we want to step into the future and be more creative and use these spaces that we're designing for more creative work, but we actually don't know how. We don't know. And there was also a question with tools. Okay, we want to be more hybrid. We want to include people in this creative session, but we know that maybe two people won't be able to join us on site. So what are the tools that we use actually to, to make sure that we can do this in an inclusive way? You know, so what is, and, and then there were questions like, okay, what are digital whiteboards? How do we use digital whiteboards? When do we use digital whiteboards? When does it make sense to use another tool? And so the, it just brought up all of these questions on, you know, skills that weren't there yet that, that needed to be developed, um, certain tools that people weren't aware of when to use them and for what. And so it really, it really engaged me in a lot of conversations with these teams on what they could be doing differently. And so for me, the biggest learning was, okay, the magic actually happens on the team. And only when you get to that point where you're really facilitating those team interactions, that's when teams can actually envision how they will be stepping into the future. So it does it, it moves people from, oh, this is an inspiring vision into, okay, this is actually how we're gonna do it. Yeah, um, I love this. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I was still doing a lot of education about just onboarding people onto Zoom, onboarding people onto Miro mm. um, and other whiteboard type tools. And I think now uh, in my corner of the world, there's the expectation that everybody just knows how to, use these tools. Um, but I'm not sure that's really true. And hmm. um, what I'm really hearing is that whether it's as part of the hybrid work environment and dealing with the online and offline, or in our back to office time, there's this, there's a, a skills gap of how do we use different um, actual like technical tools, but also social tools for uh, building collaborative environments for different types of things like brainstorming or planning um, or prototyping. And, and so there, there's an opportunity for using this uh, transition time to really build our skill sets around collaborative work environments. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm curious, like, what's the danger when we don't address that skills gap when we kind of leave it to people to figure it out? I mean, that was pretty apparent, right, for us as well, because as I was saying, we had some change ambassadors that understood what needed to be done because they'd been part of this process and they're intelligent people and they've worked on facilitation. You know, they facilitated teams before. And then there were other change ambassadors that had not facilitated yet and were felt a little overwhelmed. And so... Um, in those teams that didn't get those kind of, you know, facilitate that didn't get that kind of facilitation, people were going back to work and team leads were asking them to go back to work and they were still sitting in similar spots and doing the things the way they were done before. Mm -hmm. And this also caused a lot of um, friction because when we, gave the feedback up to leadership that, you know, for example, they didn't want, um, people don't really appreciate it when managers sit in, in their offices all day long and they would like to see them more and they would like for them to engage more with, with people. And they certainly don't want to be told where to sit. Um, this just left a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouth because they thought, well, we gave feedback. You asked us for feedback. We told you what the feedback is, and yet we're having to come back to the office the way we were before. And mm -hmm. also we don't really know how to do things differently because we're not having those dialogues. You know, it's not obvious that, it's not obvious to a team. It was certainly not obvious to our team um, that those conversations had to happen because you grow up, we grew up in, in, a, in a culture that where we were told what to do. And so it just doesn't come naturally to people to think, oh, well, I can do something about this myself. Right. Right. And so there needs to be an active 
you know, the change ambassadors really helped that discussion, but people just didn't see that as within their realm of possibility that they could be leading this, mm -hmm. nor were they being encouraged to do so because, you know, their team leads were telling them when to go back to the office, contrary to the behavior that you actually want to drive change. And so this creates a very, if, if, if anything, even more frustration right. than before, because you see, well, other people are somehow doing something and working on things. And why isn't this happening happening on our team? And, but I also don't really know what to do about it. I'm right. just frustrated. And so that was really difficult to watch because as I was leading the change um, management team, I couldn't be in every conversation because I was also doing this on top of my job. This was not something that I, you know, was had, my manager didn't say, okay, you can spend 50% of your time doing this. And so for me, it was also very frustrating to see that, oh, I wish I could be in those conversations and facilitating it, but I, I, I just didn't have the capacity to do so. Right. Um, what I think I'm hearing is that as we're beginning really any, um, like change management, um, but especially as we're moving back to the office, um, it's one thing to tell team leads to engage your team. And it's another thing to actually um, train them to do so. Um, and it's one thing to say, hey, like, we're going to change the way we come back to the office. And it's another thing to actually build the capacity, um, the ownership and the habits really um, to do things differently. I think, you know, we've all had the experience of like, oh, tonight I'm going to like do things differently. I'm going to floss my teeth or I'm going to hang out my clothes before I go to bed or whatever it is. Um, and then you find yourself actually in bed having not done that thing. Um, <laughs> habit change is hard. Um, like we're very much, we build neural like connections. We build a, a neural groove. And even if we haven't been in the office in years, there's this tendency to go back to the, to the old way of working if we, if we were there before. So if we really want to build a new groove, we actually have to like train people how to do that and reinforce that through habit change. Um, this is where we've been really like looking at how do we take um, like a programmatic approach and actually think about how are we propagating a new culture at the office, not just kind of going back to our old habits. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to un underline what you were saying, because for me, that was the probably the biggest insight that I made is that habits aren't formed through awareness. Mm -hmm. Can't tell people to to change something. They and they can be in you know in full um, resonating with what you say. Like yes, 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 we need that, that, that. But then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. You still do the thing that you know how to do because you don't know otherwise, or you don't you know. And then you may get a few ideas, and those that are willing to try something out maybe will, but not everyone has the mental capacity to try something new or to, you know, especially if no one are, it's just like very hard. And so that was for me, the biggest insight too, is because we had a big focus on our communication team had included um, communication, mm -hmm. a communication partner. And so we were putting a lot of effort in making sure that we had a steady communication beat every week. You know, we would be informing people what's going on. We were doing videos with leadership. Like, why do you believe in this? So that, you know, they could keep inspiring people that this was, you know, this was relevant and there was you know, leadership was um, prioritizing this. And this is how they, they were going to be stepping into the future. And these were the changes they were adopting. And I also built this huge um, story that we were sharing with people, right? This is where we're coming from. This is how we're going to step into the future. These are the tools. We created this huge mirror board with like tools that people could access, you know, articles to read, podcasts, all the things like, mm -hmm. you know, it was like this huge journey of our, our change journey. And with every, in every area where there could have been challenges where people could have been, um, struggling we were giving them resources to right. for self-study and even that like you know does not necessarily enable um habit change yeah um the analogy i draw on this is that we don't teach um children table manners through a powerpoint presentation <laughs> <Ouch>. um, <laughs> 
um, we don't like we don't yeah. we don't um, like sit down with our children and um, and explain to them the value of table manners and and what they look like. We model table manners and we reinforce behavior um, and we um, do minor corrections. Uh, and through that, we build the habit and capacity to um, to dine at a table. And we actually do that in alignment with whatever our culture is. Um, and so the way a child is taught to sit at a table um, in Japan is different than in Germany. Um, and we really need to take a very, anytime we're doing like culture change to think about it the same way that you can provide folks all the information and the motivation you want to. Um, and yet we still need to model the new behavior um, and train the new behavior, correct for the behavior to provide people like minor correction when it's time um, and reinforce the behaviors we're looking for. It, it simply doesn't work. And um, going into the office is already so much of a habit change for people that it's really, I think, very important to realize that simply reorganizing our lives to get back to the office, and we're not doing it every day. Generally, we're going to do it a couple of days a week. Uh, there is this habit change even within our weeks. And all of that takes an immense amount of cognitive load. And people just only have so much cognitive capacity. <laughs> and once we've taken like so much of it up on the commute and like rearranging their family life and actually getting into the office and figuring out how and where to sit and what the heck they're supposed to be doing here, you know, now we want them to engage in, in a, you know, in a fresh collaborative behavior. It's so much easier from a cognitive place to fall back on the old, on the old pattern, whether that was the pattern you were using at home or the pattern you were using um, in the office before the pandemic. But in any case, what we're looking for is new collaborative behaviors in the office. Mm -hmm. And we really need to build habit changes. And we can do that by um, like having trainings. We can do that by putting repetitive times on the calendar. We can do that by building internal capacity and having facilitators go out into meetings. Um, there's like many programs that can work here, but what doesn't work is just um, dumping a new thing onto leaders and saying, yeah, you just need to go do this mm -hmm. um, without mm -hmm. actually providing them the ongoing support uh, because they may not know how, they may not have had to actually build these new habits anywhere on their team before. Um, they might've been kind of picking up where someone else left off and just ongoing like with the work and these kind of micro changes, mm -hmm. but doing these kinds of macro changes requires support. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, I imagine there's a lot of team leads right now, like just feeling incredibly stretched as they're trying to organize their own lives to get back into the office, um, organize their teams to get back in the office and really needing to show up in some new way um, that is different than the kind of Dilbert days of like, you know, drones in their little cubicles or phone booths um, doing their solo work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's really like on one hand, it's, it's challenging times um, because we're needing to do all these new things. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I really feel like um, it's exciting because we can be talking about what does it look like to co-locate and the joy of working together. Um, it means if we do this well, we really get the best of both worlds. We get to be in our homes to do our um, solo focused work. And we also get to come together to do our innovative, creative, collaborative work together. Mm -hmm. So there's a real, like on the other side of this change management is a real opportunity to kind of live in the best of all worlds. Yeah, 100%. And I fully, I, I really, I really think that what you said kind of hit the nail on the head because you said, you know, team leads are already overwhelmed. Like if anything, the commuting time was replaced with meeting time. Mm -hmm. And so we're already in back-to-back -back meetings more. I mean, I think Microsoft studies show the increase in meetings, right? Um, it's insane. And so you're asking middle, your team leads that essentially are already juggling so many things and so many other strategic initiatives to yet take another one and implement it somehow. 
Mm-hmm. And if you're not providing any type of guidance or structure or helping them figure out how they're going to facilitate this and how, you know, what are the resources that'll help them actually facilitate this habit change, you know, um, then it's just going to be another bullet point on the agenda. Right. It's just going to be, this is food for thought. Think about it, how we could step into the future and nothing's going to happen Yeah, because people just don't have the time. And so I think it is really about a habit change. And if you do want to, you know, as we were talking about in in previous uh, LinkedIn lives, if you do want to accelerate innovation because remote work has slowed down innovation because number one, we're not talking with each other as often and we're not, you know, we don't have those uh, spontaneous uh, interactions and the in-person uh, collaborative sessions are just more inspiring and productive because we don't have that. And then also because we're in back-to-back meetings, so it delays conversation. So we're just all together, just less efficient in terms of how we uh, innovate. Mm-hmm. And so if we really want to accelerate that and keep our the flexibility that we gained during the pandemic it really does need a careful consideration of how we're setting up change Mm -hmm. and how we're training people and uh, facilitating um, them to actually step into the, into the, into the future differently. Yeah. Um, You know, next week um, we're going to be joined um, by Kirsten Davidson of Employera. Um, I'm excited for us to have our first guest Um, and, um, she's going to be bringing her immense expertise, um, with really building employer brand, um, and, and, um, just a vast wealth of case studies and how different, um, employers have been dealing with this change. So I'm very excited about that. Me too. Um, With that, we're going to be releasing our playbook, um, for, um, going back to the office and moving into creating a culture of ownership and innovation as we move into the office again. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And then we are going to be moving on to new topics. Um, so for mm-hmm. those who are catching this, um, we have been on the topic of, uh, of returning to office and, and hybrid work for several weeks now. Um, so you can, you're welcome to go back and watch those lives. And then we have one more before we're going to move on to, to new ground. So thanks so much for joining Thank us this week. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And we'll see well, you next week. Next week. <laughs>